So my name is Pete Flint. Um, uh, it's great to be back at the virtual Marketplaces conference. Um, just a uh, a little bit of background. So, um, you know, my my experience in in building marketplaces first in Europe, um, building a travel marketplace as well as a founding uh, team member with Lastbin.com and then uh, founder and CEO of Trulia, the real estate marketplace, um, and now with NFX um, and uh, NFX Lost Marketplaces. So my partner James is speaking uh, uh, at the event, um, and we love. Um, uh, we love uh, marketplaces and have a ton of experience in them. So um, maybe just uh, context for this presentation. So uh, this presentation is called the new rules of growth versus profitability. And the fundamental thing and, and the reason we're, we're talking about this is so many times uh, I get asked this question. As a tech investor, would you prefer to see more growth or more profitability? Uh, which is a sort of a common question that so many marketplaces get. So. Next slide. The um, uh, the the answer is obviously both, um, and uh, and it's a nuanced answer, and it's not a very helpful answer, and it's a false dichotomy, and it obviously depends on so many different factors um, to to make that decision. Um, and I've often found that you know in my experience building marketplaces, advising and investing in marketplaces, that this is a, a perennial question that comes up. Um, should I invest in more in growth versus um, versus profitability? So, next slide. So the uh, so so maybe before we, we talk about growth versus profitability, um, because frankly, for many companies uh, right now, growth versus profitability could almost seen as a luxury. Um, survival is the kind of number one priority um, for for many companies. So. Uh, I'll talk for a moment about just just thoughts on kind of navigating this this new reality that we're in, um, and then thinking about kind of what is growth versus profitability. Because frankly, those are secondary to to understand that the um, the position we're in. So, firstly, adapting to new new reality. So, um, fundamentally, it's understanding cash position and try to extend runway as as long as possible, and then and then really thinking about how do you grow and scale. And we'll talk about this a little bit more um in a little bit more detail um and then really thinking about what is the long-term balancing act and we and I, I i always think about growth versus profitability as a almost a tightrope walk um and figuring out what is the how do you evolve um your profitability profile which necessarily will impact your growth profile as the as the business matures and the, and the business extends so next slide So, uh, so firstly, just a, a little heuristic which um, the Weibull, which which you can find online, is really to think about how do you make these decisions between what do you do right now, um, and it's a combination of figuring out what is your um, unit profitability and contribution margin. Which the sooner that gets to profitability, the better it is. Because frankly, if you're growing and losing money, then it's an extremely challenging position uh, for almost all companies. Secondly, is uh, do you have enough cash to survive? Uh, and and frankly, if if not, get profitable. Give yourself enough um, time to get out of um, you know this this sort of this downturn. Um, so really, first things first is focusing on contribution margin, and then also focusing on and, and unit profitability, um, and then secondly, focusing on staying the cash runway. Uh, so next slide. And well, why don't you click through these, Jen, um, just so we get the full transition. So, um, you know, quickly going into the sort of crisis playbook as we think about it, set a cash floor, ensure your contribution margin profitable, um, extend runway to 18 plus months, iterate on the product to identify profitable streams. Uh, and I think there may be one or one or two more. Um, uh, and then finding growth channels to to derive efficiency, and then the, the, one of the key things here is to think about what is your um, uh, CAC to LTV ratio, but also payback period. Um, figuring out payback period is critical to to understand how efficiently and rapidly you can grow. So next slide. So more on this in um, 
uh, on nfx.com. Um, 28 moves in downturn. There's an article we wrote really about really thinking through the three phases. One is to, to manage losses. Um, how do you manage the, the transition, which for many companies, that's an act action they took in March and April. Um, then gaining ground and then beyond that, managing psychology, thinking about culture, thinking about organizational psychology, your own psychology is critical to, to, to navigate this period. So next slide. So as I shared earlier, this, this balance between growth and profitability is, um, is one of the key things for startup leaders to, to evaluate. And I, I often think, I, again, think about it, this, this balancing act, because there are certain times of, of a startup's evolution um, where growth is absolutely paramount. Um, and similarly, there are times of a startup's evolution where profitability is paramount. And this may change the, the stage of the business, the competitive environment, and also the economic environment in terms of, um, in terms of the, uh, uh, how easy it is to fundraise. So we could talk about three different stages uh, for companies and a couple of different frameworks about how to think through uh, how to navigate this. So on the on the frameworks piece, um, first I want to start with a framework that was um, uh, highlighted by David Sachs of uh, PayPal and Yammer and Craft Ventures, which is really thinking about what is the operational efficiency of the uh, of the startup. So. Um, this is defined as um, net burn divided by net new ARR. Um, and just some sort of heuristics here about um, what the efficiency is it amazing um, or is it bad? And, and uh, there's an example, if you click next, um, which is uh, to think about a, uh, a startup, for example, a startup that burned 2 million in the quarter while adding 1 million to its ARR. That's a two, um, 2x burn multiple which is reasonable for an early stage startup. Um, and clearly, if you're growing rapidly in terms of net new ARR, but you're losing a ton of cash, then that's a very challenging situation. The second um, uh, 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 framework that, that's quite popular is the rule of 40, typically used for later stage companies. And so here you can see rule of 40 is revenue growth um, plus EBITDA margin. And there's the rule of, you know, these sort of isotopes here, rule of 40, rule of 50, rule of 60. Um, and typically companies that are later stage, um, so probably um, series C or beyond can think about this. And you can also think about this um, as a business where you're thinking about this is what's the, what's the um, growth rate plus EBITDA margin, perhaps on different segments or different, um, or different uh, business lines, um, mature business lines versus emerging business lines. So one of the interesting things um, next, if you uh, if you do the empirical analysis, um, which we've done on on what is the market cap of public companies um, against this rule of forty, and and the and the sort of typical um, SaaS investor may look at this. We just want to be above this forty isotope, um, but when you look at the evidence, um, it's pretty clear that the high revenue multiple companies um, appear in the high growth um, quadrants. You can see here that, um, you know, while there is this sort of this, um, uh, uh, sometimes a seesaw between high growth and, and high profitability expectations, fundamentally growth trumps profitability. Um, and so you can see that in the data from, from public companies. And so clearly you don't wanna be below the isotope of, um, um, so isobar, not isotope, the isobar of, um, of a low revenue multiple, um, it, isobar of, of, of um, below 40, but growth trumps profitability. And I think there's, you know, one thing that I recognize uh, right now is that there, you know, can be this sort of whipsaw from growth at all costs to this environment of, okay, we need to get profitable. Um, you know, the profitability may be defined by the ability to raise, but fundamentally high growth companies are, are rewarded with a high, high multiple. Um, and so at the margin, growth is critically important um, if you're looking to build a huge company. So next. And so, you know, the, the sort of 
the framework that we think about this is in terms of a, um, a, a the startup glide path, which is like startups um, typically will initially grow, um, hopefully very quickly, and then you know have significant losses. And over time, as they approach IPO, the very best companies, particularly in the 2019 cohort, um, were companies that were both profitable and had high growth. And so optimizing for both um, is going to be critical. And, and next, we're going to talk through a couple of different phrases, uh, phases about early stage, mid stage, and, and late stage. So why don't you click through um, these, Jen? And um, uh, and so I'm not, there we go. Um, so early stage, uh, the growth is paramount. Um, growth for many investors is really a proxy for product market fit. Um, and if you look at the, um, if, if you correlate early stage growth with um, the, a company's later stage valuation, high growth in the early stage often correlates with um, high valuations at the later stage. And it really um, demonstrates the opportunity for a company that has found product market fit and has um, the potential to be a category, lead, category leader. The, um, one of the key constraints um, uh, it for for growth is obviously cash payback, and uh, and the more important the 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 greater the understanding of cash payback, a uh, CAC payback, um, the easier it is for the company to to grow. So it's a um, it's critical that a startup understands the the CAC payback, um, and the and the faster the the um, the shorter that the CAC payback, the faster it can grow. And that is not just a function of efficient. Um, uh, not just a function of, of, of efficient marketing, but often it's, it's a function of like, how are you charging your customers? So optimizing for that um, is critical. Retention is product market fit. Um, finding product market fit before expanding, spending aggressively on growth. Investors will see through this, that if you're growing quickly, um, but inefficiently, it's clearly, um, you're just wasting your time and you waste your money. And then for this stage, you know, we like to look for, Three to five x plus annual growth at the uh, at this stage, and you know many many startups of five x plus, which is obviously highly desirable. So next, uh, going on to the mid stage. So uh, mid stage, think about this as really the um, the stage where uh, a company has got some scale, um, the core business, um, which you know that it's it's the, the more mature side of the business um should be thought of as something which is um has the path to be so you could think of this as the early cohorts are highly profitable um uh the core business of them allocated um allocated expenses or first years are profitable and really you know this is a time where um as a marketplace leader or a um, startup leader um, the benefit of optionality can be huge. Uh, and, and I saw this in, in um, Trulia in sort of cash in 2009. Um, the benefit of optionality is huge. And so that doesn't mean that you become profitable, but it does mean that you can raise it in your own terms. And you can think about, I have a core business that is profitable. And then once I understand my scalable and efficient marketing channels, I can scale that rapidly or, or, and I can expand in product direction and think about how do I business into new business lines. Um, and so thinking about that, think about the optionality is gonna be critical and, and, and baking in that optionality, um, you know, frankly gives you the uh, more control of your business and how you raise money. And so next, next slide in terms of um, later stage companies. <clears throat> uh, so fundamentally, um, as we shared earlier from the rule of 40, growth beats profit, um, uh, particularly the, um, the growth side. I think um, we'll talk about network effects in a minute, but um, the companies that have uh, high growth and, um, you know, or, or like weak profitability or, or in their overall business, but some profitability in their core business are demonstrating uh, high growth. Obviously, the the um, there's a lot that goes into how you think about valuation, but predictability is a key component um, of this. So the, the more diversified the revenue streams, 
um, the more predictable and recurring they are, um, the more visibility you have in your business, that um, that has a key driver in terms of the value of the business that you're building, not just from the budgeting perspective, but you know, investors really dislike volatility, particularly at this late stage. So next slide. So, uh, so let me talk for a moment just around um, network effects. So, so a lot of these sort of frameworks, um, whether it's the um, burn multiple or whether it's the rule of 40, are really discounting network effects, which are critical for, for marketplace businesses. Um, so the weaker the network effect, um, really the, um, uh, the, the goal here and, and what's important is to think about how do you drive scale benefits of the business that they don't they're not obviously network effects but they are some sort of um other lock-in so the way that investors will look at this is if they see net negative revenue churn so the the business the the revenue per customer starts increasing over time and there's a clear path to profitability and so um uh so so in weaker network effect businesses um looking at how you can increase penetration or increase um average order value is is critical and next, next slide. So, um, you know, that there, there's a popular, um, if you think about the last couple of years, um, two terrific books, uh, Ile Gill and Reid Hoffman uh, wrote Blitz Scaling and, and the High Growth Handbook, really were huge proponents of this notion of grow at all costs, um, which in, in some ways has been created multiple billion dollar companies. On the flip side, um, has created a number of challenges as well. Um, you know, I, I think the, the challenge here has been that um, blitz scaling has been applied to many businesses that are not network effect businesses. Um, and so this has created a whole bunch of downstream problems. And it's sort of the, you know, the, perhaps the visceral example is, uh, is WeWork. Um, which has created, and, and many other DTC companies that adopted this playbook. And it was frankly just, just very um, ill-advised and inappropriate for them. So next slide. Um, so clearly with, when, with marketplace businesses and with network effects, um, it's a blitz scaling can be extremely effective. Um, and given the nature of network effects and when it takes take most outcome, um, investors do have a significant appetite for um, for investing in in these businesses, um, and I think clearly the in some respects the later stage capital has pulled back. But there is a um, for some of the best companies, particularly category leaders, they can still find uh, access to capital and to um, and to find capital to continue to scale and achieve a, that leadership position. So I'm going to move faster because we're running out of time. So uh, next slide. So uh, just, I guess, in, so in summaries, summary, so we've stabilized cash to find efficient runway, optimize on, on CAC payback period. Um, to Product market fit is really about efficient and retained growth. Um, optionality for mid-stage companies. Um, and, um, you know, clearly investors will still apply premium uh, on growth. So you know, I think wouldn't, while these are cautious times, um, the, the fear is you're over cautious um, and particularly for network effects, um, that's a huge, that could potential to be a huge value destruction, uh, value destructing driver. So um, just finally, and then we'll kind of transition to, um, uh, you know, click through these. So a few resources, um, a deeper dive onto this, um, NFX, we publish a bunch of stuff. Um, so go and sign up for email updates. Um, we have an investor database at signornfx.com. And we have a, a tool for um, fundraising called the Company Brief that we recommend you figure out. So why don't, um, let's, uh, let's switch over to questions. Okay. Um, so, all right. So Nick, regards to three to five X annual growth, would you use GMV to measure this? Um, so this is principally, um, GMV, or I guess I would probably hope it's on net revenue. Um, uh, because obviously you can, uh, you can, you can fuel growth if you're not, uh, if your rake is, um, is discounted, but I would, 
I would think about this really as as net revenue, um, which would be the the key driver, particularly for marketplaces. Uh, Lucas, uh, you're a great. Uh, thank you, Lucas. Um, encourage everyone to sign up for email alerts. Um, Sumit, is the rule of forty less applicable for businesses with strong network effects? Um, Yes, uh, absolutely. I think it's, I mean, it's traditionally the rule of 40 is, is a use for SaaS companies. And I, um, but it's a helpful indicator as you think about uh, uh, companies that have greater scale. Um, and so it is, it's a helpful framework to think about. The, the other thing to note is, you know, the rule of 40 is not something which is like, you have to be both profitable and growing. Um, you know, you can also extend the rule of, the, the, the rule of 40 to you might be growing 100 percent a year uh, but losing from that um but I, I think it's a uh for for smaller for earlier companies it's not a great it's not a great measure john um how widely do you find growth just revenue growth um uh yeah i mean this the principally we're talking here about marketplaces so um uh so clearly growth is um you know one way to look at this is in is in uh in revenue growth you know i i know from the experience running running truly we we actually had this in early on we were under monetizing um and we we actually the the metric that we um that we used was more a revenue potential so we're looking at the economic activity going through the platform that we weren't monetizing so if you so if you're not monetizing but you are um you are tracking the economic activity moving through the platform and you have a proxy for how much you think you can monetize percentage of that you can monetize that can be a um that can be a um uh, a helpful measure how do you monetize measure how do you measure network effect well okay we don't have enough time for that um but that is a great question um uh and we, I think there's, we have um, 14 different network effects on nfx.com um, with varying degrees of, of strength. Um, that's, pr I'd probably point you to that article. Um, uh, Florence, thanks. Regarding growth means profitability, close to IPO. Are investors getting more skeptical of fast-growing companies in the near term? Yeah, so I think this is really about looking at the um, at the cohorts, um, whether that's whether that's cohorts by maturity or cohorts by uh, geography, um, and I think you're absolutely right. There's, you know, if you think about Uber specifically, Uber at the beginning of this year, Dara said the growth at all costs era is over, um, and um, and that is a it's often a function of companies and their maturity, um, and you see in Lyft and Uber. Um, who are seeing that, and I think absolutely um, investors are more skeptical today. And and really, you know, I'd say we work first the bubble here. Um, okay, Paul, uh, last year you mentioned FinTech and Marketplace. Do you see this coming true? And what's next? Yeah, absolutely. So we um, we presented last year. Um, I presented last year this the notion of FinTech enabled marketplaces to the, be the next era of marketplaces. So um if you, if you want to check out the article then absolutely we're starting to see that more and more increasing virtualization of marketplaces um in increasing focus on uh, value capture is pushing uh, marketplaces to increasingly focus on on um on uh adding fintech components for an early stage would you consider more important to accomplish a gmv forecast or the take rate um i would focus on gmv uh, uh, at the early stage, I think there is a, a danger that if it's going from free to to, to something paid, um, and it does depend on the type of marketplace, but GMV is is more important to show economic activity. Could you please quantify quick growth for an IPO and company? Um, so probably I would say uh, north of 50%. Um, but, you know, I, I would say that so north 50 to 100 percent, um, you know, the reality is that um, later stage um, companies. So if you if you think about this rule of 40 and really the best companies are 
50 and 60. Um, so if you think of a company that is their EBITDA is zero and their growth rates are 50 or 60, then that's a um, that's a good benchmark to be in in the top tier. Uh, and uh, uh, Cyril, um, are there some particular types of benefits that don't work during the downturn? Um, good question. Um, I guess uh, I guess I don't think so. Um, I think um, I think I we think of kind of network effects as really a law of nature um, that they exist, and uh, I think there are certain types of businesses that don't work in the downturn, but um, I think network effects fundamentally are actually you know if you have them they can become extremely attractive. Frankly, because growth is cheaper during a downturn. Um, and so that gives the ability for um, companies with network effects to strengthen their network effects, um, assuming they can they can, they can execute. Uh, Nishant, what's your take on the future of workforce, more specifically permanent versus temporary remote talent? Um, I, I just I just published an article um, on Tuesday about the future of um, uh, labor marketplaces that might be interesting. Um, you know, the, the difference between um, permanent versus temporary probably uh, is down to a combination of the employment tenure um, and the, uh, uh, the employment tenure and the salary of the individual. If you're, uh, and, and I think this is to, to specifically, is this a recruiting model or is this a staffing model? Um, permanent would typically be more of a recruiting model, um, temporary staffing model. And so for high frequency or short duration um, uh, hiring, then it's more likely to be temporary. But the article says more about it. All right, we're out of time. Thanks, everyone. Uh, have a good day. Stay safe, stay healthy. Take care.